Azure, uh, where it stands today, where it came from, uh, and then uh, how it fits into customer situations. So uh, we're also going to cover uh, a customer case study, which might be very similar to what you might be investigating into implementing. Uh, we're gonna look at the situation and the needs. Um, quite often with cloud computing, there are certain objections to go to the cloud. We're gonna talk about some of those things, see what those objections are and see if we can you know, make it more comfortable uh, for a reason to move to the cloud. So with that said, <clears throat> Um, we're also going to be covering uh, an understanding of how uh, Azure components map to existing IT services. Uh, we're going to identify some specific services to pilot. And then finally, we'll just go right into a demo. And uh, we're actually going to set up, uh, you know, go through the, the steps of setting up an Azure infrastructure. So uh, let's get to it. And I'll just see if my slides cooperate there. So before we uh, get into the history, um, we should probably ask ourselves, why should we care about cloud services? Well, there's a couple questions that you might want to ask yourself. <clears throat> Are cloud services the way to go in terms of how you want to spend your money? Uh, there's uh, capital expenditures versus operational expenditures. Uh, if you have been using a CapEx model for quite some time, uh, that's okay. You're investing uh, money up front uh, into an infrastructure that you have that might last um, three to five years. Most likely uh, it's a lot longer than that. Um, however, that sometimes leads to an aging infrastructure. Um, operational expenditures uh, with cloud services, you know, give you a more of a utility-based uh, model where you pay as you go, and uh, it gives you a little bit more flexibility on what you want to include. Uh, you, you should ask yourself how flexible is my infrastructure? Uh, can the servers adapt to changing demand? So, you know, right <clears throat> right now we're getting around the the Christmas holidays and uh, in retail, that means big business. Uh, as we get closer to the end of the year, then, you know, financial accounting, uh, tax season comes along. You know, can you adapt to changing demands for that? You also want to ask yourself, uh, are you able to have or sustain an outage um, for a period of time? And can you get your services back up in a reasonable amount of time? You know, what is your service level agreement with your infrastructure? Ask yourself also, where's my data? Is it just in one place um, or is it being backed up? Is the data redundant? Is there uh, data elsewhere I can point to in case, you know, where I'm pointing to right now it goes down? Compliance is a or uh, compliance is a, a big issue. Um, you know, you want to ask yourself: Are you meeting or exceeding compliance measures based on your business? And also, how well can you scale? Uh, do you have an infrastructure that is capable of increasing or decreasing as you need? So, really, <clears throat> the bottom line of cloud services is. Uh, you know, all of the above, all these questions you should ask yourself. And also it's, you know, paying, you're only paying for the services to get your work done. Um, and the best thing about cloud services is really, you don't have to worry about the science of the data centers that go behind it. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, a brief tour in a little bit about that. Uh, there's, there are uh, certain elements of a cloud I wanted to explain. Um, so whether you're Azure or Amazon AWS or you're, you're leveraging any type of cloud services, maybe even you know uh, so other software as a service components like Salesforce or things like that, you want to think about you know elasticity, uh, scalability, pooling, and provisioning. I know these are technical terms, but basically these are elements that all go into what a good cloud solution is. Elasticity means that you can have traffic bursts. You can dynamically adjust uh, to resources as you need them. Scalability means that uh, how many servers can I spin up uh, if I need extra processing? 
or how many additional applications can I layer on to give me more functionality? Uh, and then pooling is really the on tap services. Uh, you're paying for what you use. And then also provisioning. Cloud services give a, a wonderful uh, way of being able to self-provision uh, servers, infrastructure, platforms, uh, even software as a service, uh, depending on what the business needs are. Uh, for example, developers uh, can spin up web services very easily to start coding. They don't have to worry about building a server or anything like that in the background. It's just a platform that spins up for them. And also, along with provisioning, you also want to make sure that you can uh, separate out the roles of what your users are allowed to do. And so that's why there's role-based access management built into any good cloud service. So history of Azure, um, probably back in 1986, we were thinking, you know, what is the big deal about computers? In 96, we're thinking, what's the big deal about the internet? And then a little more than 10 years ago, we're thinking about what's the big deal about cloud computing? And uh, if you think about it, actually uh, Azure is uh, approaching its 10th birthday. Uh, in 2008, it was officially announced as Windows Azure. And back then, uh, there wasn't really much going on. It, it kind of was just like a, a directory, a, a, a directory service for users to log on to. It established identities. Um, other than that, it was kind of an ethereal type of thing that was out there. It wasn't until 2010 when it was officially renamed uh, Windows Azure. Uh, that's when uh, it, the platform was taken over by Scott Guthrie. Uh, he was a VP at Microsoft and he kind of took it away from an older development platform to what's currently known as HTML5, uh, a web portal. And at, in 2010, it started to actually feel like a set of services you can use. Now in 2014, uh, there were additional things that were coming into the picture. And that's why the, the name Windows Azure actually became Microsoft Azure because there was actually less Windows of, things about it. It was getting more into agnostic platforms such as Linux uh, and Citrix and things like that, that, you know, these were not Microsoft products, but they could, these are products that could actually run on Azure. So they renamed it Microsoft Azure. Now today, the logo uh, has taken a drastic turn and you can see it's kind of like a little triangle here. And, and the thing about it is that this represents that it's a totally agnostic platform now. We're going to look at the interface and see the products and services you can spin up, but um, the um, I would say that the uh, minority of the platforms is actually Windows. Most of it is uh, open source uh, programs and services that are being offered in Azure today. So it has really taken a change there. Today, in 2018, uh, coming up, Azure really represents a, a whole slew of products. Uh, we can start with the, uh, and let me change my pointer option here to uh, be able to point this out here. So we have uh, compute, networking, and storage. This, this is really the area that I focus on uh, most of the time for infrastructure. But then there's mobility and containers and databases. Um, these go more into the application level of Azure where developers can spin up app services, develop uh, mobile applications. Containers are, are actually uh, basically groups of servers that you can spin up and it gives a, a platform to develop applications. For a database administrator, uh, Azure supports not only the you know, traditional Microsoft SQL, but uh, NoSQL, MySQL, uh, and other forms of databases. As you get into the data and artificial intelligence and Internet of Things, uh, this is really where uh, Azure is starting to shine, um, especially with Internet of Things. I, I would think that uh, some of us, at least some of us, have certain devices in our homes that you can actually turn on and uh, using your mobile device. It understands like weather patterns. If you, if you have an irrigation system, it might put on a delay when it 
uh, when the irrigation turns on because it, it understands the internet, it, it's aware of the weather patterns and things like that. Azure supports, uh, they're, they're actually doing a lot of machine learning and analytics in that realm today. Uh, hybrid cloud is probably a term that you've uh, heard of. Um, it's a real easy approach. If you're not ready for Azure yet, you can actually establish a hybrid component of it where in most cases uh, you have your on-prem uh, capital expenditures and your Azure operational expenditures that you can kind of move components up to the cloud as you, as you need to do um, at your own leisure. And finally, uh, we have monitoring and management, which really isn't much different than what might be in use today. Uh, if you happen to use System Center for doing some management or uh, SCOM for, op for mon monitoring, uh, those tools actually don't need to change, but Azure provides the platform to run those tools on. Plus, they have other types of tools uh, that are more Azure focused to help you keep a alert um, on what's going on in your in your environment. Microsoft Azure Stack, I'm going to show you just a quick glimpse of what that is. Um, it's actually a, a hybrid cloud model that helps facilitate you moving to a, to a cloud solution. Just a, a brief overview of um, Azure data centers. Now, when we think of cloud services, if you look up at the clouds, typically you don't really care what's behind the clouds. There could be airplanes, there could be uh, satellites up in space. You don't really don't know, and you don't really have to think about it because the data centers are really managed by experts, uh, you know, from Microsoft, and uh, and these data centers are across the world. The data centers are designed specifically to give both a global reach and a local presence. So even though you might have data that is uh, sitting um, on the other side of this, this uh, country, it still feels like you are locally accessing it. Um, the data centers are secure and compliant. They exceed uh, every, uh, uh, every, I would say, uh, uh, form of compliance that's out there. Uh, we can provide some information on uh, on Azure, you know, and, and how it meets those needs, um, especially for those of you who might be undergoing auditing and things like that. You know, you have to make sure you have a data center that is really secure. And then the, finally, the cool thing about Azure is that it helps advance the sta uh, sustainable future. And we'll go by by that. I'll show you what I mean. If you were to walk into a Azure data center today, this is typically what you'll see. Um, it's really a, a, like a, a clean room. Uh, there's re redundant power, there's battery backups, uh, servers, um, and everything is just you know very clean and neat. Again, this is the data center science that you don't have to worry about. So you don't have to worry about you know loose cables or you know cables hanging behind servers and tripping on them. You know this is this is a state of the art uh, data center uh, representative Azure. When Azure uh, designs data centers, first of all, they put in a lot of resources in order to make it happen. Uh, but they also want to make sure that everything is efficient uh, as possible. They're really moving towards more of a clean energy solution in terms of cooling and water, operational and, and doing battery recycling. And uh, you might want to ask yourself too, like when I'm taking advantage of cloud data, where is my cloud data actually stored? Well, in most cases, it's up to you. There's over, uh, right today, there's over 44 uh, Azure regions out there. And Azure region represents one or maybe a few data centers within that region. Uh, we definitely have a couple uh, data centers within the uh, West US or West US 2. Um, and we have them all across the world here, as you can see. So you can actually select where you want to store your data or replicate your data. So if you uh, need uh, disaster recovery within Azure, uh, this is the, the regions that are possible. There are certain regions um, that you might uh, look at that are government or Department of Defense. Um, these are definitely 
you know, off hands for public consumption. These are more for government contracts. So if you are part of a government contract or a government organization, uh, you know, this might be, uh, you know, for you to take advantage of the, uh, the Azure data centers that are dedicated for government. So those are the regions um, and also how they're connected uh, it's pretty astounding uh, the amount of investment that Microsoft has put into making Azure happen. Uh, these lines here actually represent uh, undersea and across the land uh, fiber. There's 2 million kilometers of intra data center fiber that's laid across uh, to connect each data center. What this provides is a 72 plus terabyte per second backbone from data center to data center. Uh, if you think about that, it's really hard to think about. It is really fast. So these are very high speed connections. Uh, at the time of this slide, there were 40 Azure regions. There's much more now. This equates to hundreds of data centers and even millions of servers. So the investment that Microsoft has put in to making this work is pretty astonishing. Um, it's one of the largest networks on the planet. It's purely Microsoft owned. Uh, there's multiple paths uh, for maximum reliability and redundancy. Uh, and uh, it uh, connects over 100 points of presence. Uh, and it uses technologies such as content delivery network, which improves performance and traffic flow. So when you're connecting up to one of these Azure data centers, uh, you'll probably notice that it really feels like it's part of your own server room or your own data center itself. So it's quite amazing. Just as an example, uh, this isn't a cruise ship. This is actually a ship that lays down the undersea cables. Uh, at the time of this slide, they were laying uh, down uh, connections between the APAC regions and the west coast of the United States. They're, they're also laying down additional fiber connections between Spain and the east coast of the United States. So uh, it's a long trip. So I'm sure they're out there at sea for a very long period of time. And so, um, again, one of the cool things about using cloud services, and especially Azure, is that they're committed to uh, sustainability. By 2020, they expect to be 60% uh, usage from wind, solar, and hydropower. And one day, you know, it'll be 100%. So the more you're using cloud services, the more you're helping support, uh, you know, a, a clean, clean energy. So we're going to shift topics here. Uh, hopefully that was a good overview of what Azure is, its history, and uh, and what actually looks what it looks like behind the clouds. There, uh, you could tell that people are very busy at work, you know, making very uh, you know high high powered, highly available data centers uh, for your usage. So this is a case study which might be very similar to yours. Um, it's the as an example, it's a publishing company whose offices are in New York and San Diego. It has infrastructure um, which is aging. And the CIO, um, he's forward thinking, fortunately. He's saying that, you know, like every other business, we are under constant pressure to do more with less. You know, we believe that cloud computing will substantially be cheaper over time, which is true. Over time, uh, there there is a good argument for that. They have um, already completed uh, a migration to Office 365. Perhaps many of you have already completed a migration to Office 365 or are thinking about it. Um, but more and more, I would say today, uh, more of our customers Oh, and new customers especially, have already made that transition to some type of cloud solutions. So they're already out there, but now they're wanting to move additional resources from their aging data centers or from their aging server rooms up to Azure. In this example, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be transitioning a uh, single sign-on project to uh, Office 365. So single sign-on, um, if some of you are familiar, uh, there's Active Directory Federation Services, which is a great form to provide users single sign-on capabilities, uh, not only with Office 365, but with other 
uh, software as a service applications. However, ADFS, it requires hardware, it requires or, or requires virtual machines in your data center in order for that to run. So if you're going to add more machines, you know, why not add them to the cloud? Uh, so that's what we're, that's what this uh, situation is going to focus on is moving a, uh, a workload of Active Directory Federation servers to the cloud. Again, it could be any workload that we're talking about. I'm just using ADFS as an example here, um, but it could be a, a procurement system. It could be a web application that is running on web servers in your environment that you might want to move to the cloud. Um, so that's the whole idea here. So the situation with them continues is that um, they like to pilot this workload They, you know, before they commit to going to the cloud. Um, the concern is around security. You know, who's going to have access to these systems in the cloud? Now, they have systems that are running on 2012 R2, which is a fairly recent platform. However, uh, Windows Server 2016 is really currently being used and is going to be supported uh, down the future. They already own software and assurance, and they don't want to change any of their application codes or anything like that. Um, one thing with uh, software assurance is that they don't necessarily want to spend additional licenses if they move to uh, the cloud. So let's see what kind of uh, other needs are. So this company, uh, maybe like yours, they, they are looking to do a solid cloud to VPN connection. Uh, they want this VPN connection to be always on. Uh, it's able to migrate and sustain uh, connectivity to their offices. They're concerned about um, making sure they can isolate privileges for managing the cloud infrastructure. You know, they don't want to give the keys to the you know kingdom to everyone out there. So, what that's one concern that they really need. Uh, they like to keep the application running in high availability mode. Uh, no single points of failure. And uh, they like to be able to test it before they're going to production. And once they migrate, they'd also like to have a rollback plan. So I'm sure many of you have projects that are coming up that you know, you, you're know you ready, you're almost ready to get out there, but you really want to have some form of way of backing out in case you know something uh, unexpected happens. Some of the objections that customers will tell us is that, you know, this application, we only wanted to make it accessible by our employees. We're, we're, we don't want other people to have access to it. Um, they, you know, another concern is, like I mentioned, they have Windows Server licenses already. They don't want to have to pay for them again. The uh, team that they are... Um, that they use to support their systems, they're they're already used to using what they're using for managing the systems. This particular organization is using System Center, and they're concerned, you know, for having their their staff, which is a very small IT staff, to learn a new technology. And uh, and finally, you know, they are concerned about granting someone access to an Azure subscription and making everything else available to them. That would definitely be a blocker for them. So let's see what kind of uh, uh, solutions there are out there. So for the one of the objections for uh, you know making sure that the application is only accessible from their employees is there's two things highlighted in yellow here. These are Azure specific. Uh, products. One, one's actually a, a service uh, and another one is a feature. Azure Express Route is actually a dedicated and private uh, virtual network. And the, the nice thing about it, Azure Express Route, it doesn't traverse the public internet at all. It's really a dedicated circuit between you and the Azure data center. So when you uh, are using Azure, you're actually using a nice dedicated and private circuit. No one else can uh, can do that, uh, can even get in because it is part of your internal infrastructure. 
Network security groups on top of that can provide additional access. They work very much like firewalls. So if you have a someone who manages a, a firewall within your organization, uh, you can put in certain ACLs or access control lists to prevent uh, certain ports or services from getting through. One of the other objections is that they have uh, server licenses uh, already. They don't want to have to pay for it. Well, one of the features in Azure is there's a bring your own licensing uh, component in there that allows you to uh, just use what you have. You, you know, why not leverage your existing investment uh, and use Azure at the same time? So that is definitely uh, an option there. Uh, for the concern of granting users access to Azure subscriptions, you know, this is a very real concern. Um, but in order to keep that concern down, uh, what Azure has developed is what's called the Azure Resource Manager. It's actually the, the latest uh, platform that you'll see when I turn on the demo. Uh, there's also role-based access control. So you can assign control and control access um, to individuals based on what their uh, roles are. In addition, resource locks are a feature that helps prevent uh, from any changes from happening. So uh, these are all, you know, can be controlled by the Azure administrator. One of one very common uh, objection to moving to the cloud is that um, during the process of moving to the cloud, you know, it's very hard to get downtime to do anything. I'm sure it is with your business. You probably don't want, you know, when there's a schedule change, four hours might be, you know, enough time to have downtime at play in order to migrate systems. Uh, it might be even less than that. So in order to help uh, move to the cloud, there's a couple solutions here. So there's Azure Site Recovery. It's a replication process where you can replicate the information from your environment to an infrastructure in Azure. It helps in rollback if needed. Now Azure Stack is a relatively new service that actually, uh, when, I'm sorry, Microsoft will actually ship you uh, a server infrastructure that is essentially Azure. You connect to it within your environment, you build on that platform, and then when you're ready to release the platform in the cloud, you just repoint it to Azure. So Azure Stack is a very interesting offering. This, uh, this slide deck here just shows you a, a, an example of uh, Azure Site Recovery, uh, basically what it does or where it fits in. This might be your on-premise on investment of your servers and infrastructures and web services. Uh, likewise, in Azure, you can build workload VMs uh, that will represent your on-premise infrastructure, turn on Azure Site Recovery, and start replicating the data to Azure Storage and Azure Site Recovery Vault. So these are the components of Azure Site Recovery that can help aid you to get there uh, ahead of time before you actually migrate any resources. Another method to migration is using Azure Stack. And um, Azure Stack is like, what is it? Well, it is Azure. It's actually a pay-as-you-consume service. But the only difference is, is that you get shipped the equipment in various sizes that you need uh, to your infrastructure. You plug it in. You build upon this Azure infrastructure. Once it works for you, then you can start pointing those services to your actual Azure instance. So it's a <clears throat> definitely an interesting offering that uh, you might want to look into. Um, and we can provide further information on there, especially for those who are a little hesitant to really you know, commit to the cloud at first. So next, uh, we're going to dig right into it. Let's go to the live demo here. Uh, I'll stop the slides. And we will go ahead and get started here. So let's see. And let me minimize this here. 
Okay. So I wanted to first cover uh, we, what does it take to get into Azure? Um, may, maybe some of you have already signed up or maybe you already own some sort of Azure licenses or maybe you're already, already interested in pursuing Azure licensing and seeing what it's all about. Well, one of the things that uh, you can do, it's actually very easy to get signed up. Uh, if you go to azure.microsoft.com, or alternatively, you could just go to azure.com. It takes you to the same place. There's actually a nice free account sign up button. Now, when you do this, uh, it, this is a, a process that will take you to the sign in page. And when you do sign up, you do have to provide a credit card for identity purposes only. So I just want to repeat that. If you are just wanting to try it, you have to provide a credit card, but the card does not get charged. And it says right here, unless you explicit, explicitly convert to a paid offer. But it's a good idea. If you wanted to get started, you know, go ahead and sign in and, and get started and you're, you're in it. I mean, it's as easy as that. Instead, what I'm going to do, let me go ahead and go back to azure.com. I wanted to point out some things uh, before you get started. There's actually a very laid out uh, I'm sorry, very well laid out documentation uh, section here. So if you click on documentation in your in the azure.com, right away you're going to see how to get started with Azure. And there's going to be things such as uh, infrastructure, uh, app development, and data and AI. These are really the, the three main tracks of, of how people use Azure. For us, we're going to be focusing on infrastructure. If you wanted to, say, for example, learn how to set up Windows virtual machines, you can click here and it gives you a step-by-step -step approach on how to log in, how to create your first virtual machine, and it goes through the options like this. So it's a real nice way to get to know Azure services right away. Uh, there's tutorials for uh, doing load balancing, um, automation. So it's worth it for your IT department to explore these things so they can get familiarized. The other aspect of the web page is the resources. Uh, the resources, like, like the documentation, uh, gives you a real rich area to explore training. So there is a training feature right here. And there's free training that's offered for pretty much everything you need to know in Azure. It's pretty astonishing how much information that you can get out of this. Um, the, uh, the training is provided by Pluralsight. All you have to do is just click on it and sign in and you're ready to go to take, uh, you know, to take your training videos here. So um, it has rich content. Uh, I would say, you know, if you're going to be doing this, commit some time to looking at it, um, but it's very easy to follow um, and very easy to, uh, to get started. So anyway, uh, that is the training uh, and that is the documentation and resources that I wanted to show you. So now let's get into uh, what the dashboard looks like. So when I sign in, to my first Azure space, what I'm going to see is my dashboard. I, the dashboard can be configured to however you want. In my particular dashboard, I have quick start tutorials, things that go over how to set up Windows virtual machines or Linux virtual machines. There's a service health. Uh, this will provide alerts if my particular subscription area is showing you know, some issues. I'm going to get alerted right here. And then you can throw in some other things. I have a marketplace where I can shop around for additional products if I want. And then I have my, my resource group right here. Let me uh, go in to show you uh, what a resource group is. So that's the dashboard. I have uh, all my resources here on the left. And this is how it's laid out. Uh, your, your most common things that you're going to be working with are on the left side of this. If you want to explore additional services, click on more services, and by default it's going to be listed by category. 
Now, as I mentioned, Azure is, uh, you know, represents a, a whole slew of products. It's not just infrastructure, uh, but there's compute. And as we go down the list here, there's networking, storage. These are the three uh, infrastructure components of Azure that are available. And then as we get higher up the application chain, we have web and mobile services, databases, intelligence and analytics, and, and the list goes on. These are all of the things. Here's the Internet of Things that I mentioned earlier. So it's laid out in terms of category, and it kind of goes from infrastructure to more of an application and AI perspective. So think of it that way. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to start building our first server. So uh, what I'm going to do is I have a thing called a resource group. So first of all, let me click on all my, my resources here. I have a bunch of resources which span anywhere from an analytics uh, a resource to an actual virtual machine to disk to networking. So I've got a bunch of different things right here. And the way that I've divided them up, I've divided them up into what are called resource groups. So resource groups are one method of helping to, uh, helping to control the access of what users have. So if you, you only want to give maybe a developer access to a certain resource group, you can certainly do that. I'm going to click on the resource group that I have. And within here, um, I already have some, like I said, I already have some things set up in here, but I want to start spinning up another server. So as an example, I'll go ahead and just add. And it's going to ask me, okay, well, what do you want to add here? Um, there are a ton of things I can do. And as you can see, you know, Azure, it's, it's, it, is, it is pretty overwhelming on the amount of things that they have included in here. Windows servers are, you know, my cup of tea. That's exactly what I uh, work with in the majority of the time. If you're a developer uh, or a storage architect, uh, there's storage blob accounts here available. Uh, if you are uh, into uh, Linux or development, um, you can see the list goes on and on. Uh, so this is just a, a few of the things here. Red Hat Linux uh, is one thing that they're, they really are proud on supporting uh, in Azure. That's why it's first and foremost here. But I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to click on a Windows Server 2016 data center. And as you can see over here, it, it, uh, it's asking me, okay, do I want to select a resource manager or classic? Classic is something that we'll never see probably after the end of this year. Classic is going away. What classic is, it, it was this environment here. This is the classic environment where we can set up uh, certain resources and it was based uh, more on a uh, Silverlight type of application, I suppose, but it's uh, this is this experience is going away. For those of you who may have been using Azure already, you may be already be familiar with this, uh, but just keep in mind this is no longer going to be the uh, the standard. It's going to be the resource manager. So everything gets created in resource manager. So I'm going to go ahead, I'll, uh, for demo purposes, I will um, set up this server uh, named ADFS to represent my ADFS server. Uh, this gives you a selection. And just keep in mind that it is a very well laid out step-by-step -step approach. Um, you honestly don't necessarily need to be a server engineer in order to do this. Uh, it runs through you basic settings. If you have questions along the line, there's usually some informational pop-up items that help you learn more about what you need. So I'm going to go put in my, my first uh, username here. Definitely wants a strong password. Hopefully I typed that in right. Okay. 
Uh, the subscription, if you are under several subscriptions, you'll you'll be able to see them here. Uh, right now, I only have access to my Windows Azure sponsorship uh, subscription here. And then it asks for a resource group. Now, you can create a new one if I wanted, or since I already have one, I'm going to just select the one that I have there. The location is uh, Western US, although if we pointed down remember those Azure regions we can put we can put my server environment anywhere from Australia Canada Korea pretty much any region that I want so I'm setting up one server but I might want to set up my, my replica servers in another region to give some really good redundancy so let me go ahead and uh, choose West US 2 just for the heck of it this is where um, it asks me if I already have a Windows Server license. This is the BYO-L, the Bring Your Own License uh, category here. Um, in many cases, you already have it. So if you click yes, it's going to ask you to confirm and you have to prove ownership of your licenses. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna say no. I'll, I'm gonna go along with the purchase of the Azure server licenses themselves. The next step is choosing a size. Uh, what size of server do you actually need to run your application? Well, there's a lot of choices. The, um, the uh, most common choices um, are these recommended ones, but if you wanna look at all of the choices out there, you click on view all, and these are gonna show you eventually. Yep, all of the service, all of the servers that are available in every combination of size. So they start, you know, from smaller servers, from two CPUs to four CPUs, um, and then they can get quite extensive depending on the load that you're going to be running. Uh, if you have a four CPU or, or more machine, um, and if you need a whole lot of memory and a whole lot of disks, um, it, it goes up. The estimates here are, uh, are there for you. These are estimates based on average usage, so they not, they're not gonna represent the, the monthly estimate of what you would be using. You might be using less, you might be using more. It's just a, just a bare bones estimate. What I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to choose a oh, standard server here. Um, we'll go ahead with this and select it. So some of the settings in here, um, they're going to ask if you want to be part of an availability set. What an available availability set is, is uh, it, it adds redundancy to your system. So it's, think of it as uh, adding additional servers and creating a, an availability set where you might have a web application that you need to keep up and running at all times. So, um, so I can go ahead and create a new one for sake of time for this demonstration, I'm going to opt out of that and say no. Uh, I'm gonna keep all the defaults pretty much um, for this demonstration. But as I mentioned, every one of these has an informational item to help explain what exactly these mean. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, click okay. Looks good to me. We'll do the summary. It's going to load information. It's going to tell me what my running rate is per hour. I can look at that prior to actually committing to it. And, uh, you know, if, if that looks good, I'm going to spend about 20 cents per hour by running this uh, VM. I'm going to go ahead and create it. And then it goes through and it's submitting and it's deploying the server. So it's actually just spinning up an image of a server right there in front of us, and pretty soon it's going to be available. Now, instead of waiting for this, it, it probably takes about five minutes or so in order to get uh, all said and done. I already have some servers that are all set to go. So let's go ahead and see what, what it looks like when I actually uh, go into my virtual machines. So over on the left here, let me go back to virtual machines so I can see which ones I have. Shows me I have three. This is the new one that I'm creating right now. In fact, it tells me that I'm creating it. But I also have these other servers that I can simply click on 
they're running and it tells me you know for uh, the engineers in us uh, it gives us some data right off the fly here of how the server is behaving which is kind of nice um, just some of the features um, and uh, let me see if I can uh, expand this screen here yeah that looks better so in the screen here you'll see that the server uh, it has a name that I gave it it has a public IP address um, and this address here is for me to connect to the server uh, and so it gives me some information about it, but let's go ahead and actually log on to it. And to do that, there's a connect button. When I connect, it simply opens up what's known as the RDP session. So it's just like you're remoting into a server on your network. go ahead and log on as it's coming up on my other screen I'll drag it on over and kind of just show you that this is it this is my 2016 server that uh, I am running a full Active Directory environment uh, this Active Directory environment might be associated with my on-prem environment but that's the beauty of it you can have a replication between your on-premise and your Azure servers so this is an example of you know, a domain controller that's also running other services that I need. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. It's, just a, it's an infrastructure that I just stood up. The other aspect of, of uh, real quick in the uh, Azure world is the networking aspects of it. So let me zoom out a bit here. Let me get back to square one and uh, I wanted to run into what's called the uh, the network security groups. So my first server that I spun up uh, a while back, uh, let's see here, is right is this one right here, and I have what's called a network security group for this server. What a network security group is like I mentioned in the slides a while back, is an ability to control access from, from any internet source inbound to the server. Right now, the only thing that I'm allowed is, is what's called the uh, RDP, the remote desktop port. That's how I'm able to connect into the server. There's no other uh, services besides a couple built-in ones that are, these are already included uh, with the networking configuration. Uh, but right now for this one, the only way I can connect in is through this RDP session or remote desktop session. Now I have a web server that's also running and that web server, I added an additional, what's known as the SSL rule. So I can allow uh, web services to run through port uh, HTTPS connections, so secure connections because it is a web service. Now the way I'm doing this, so in my environment I have a, uh, a web server um, and I have an Active Directory Federation server and what this results in is the ability to to use these services in the cloud and I'll give you just a quick example of how Office 365 is utilizing this. For those of you who might be using Office 365, uh, you know the logon is uh, might be very similar to this, where I have to put in some type of uh, login information. I'll be caring for the day, and my domain is called uh, O365 for us. Now, typically, if I were to log in to a normal uh, non single sign-on environment, it would just take me to the next page and you know ask for my password. In this case, I'm using Azure infrastructure to redirect me to my own web services. So this is my own web services that's hosted by the platform that I've spun up. It's as easy as that. So I'm using uh, Active Directory Federation services hosted in Azure just like it's sitting in my own data center. Just 
to uh, log in all the way. Um, I can pass the credentials on all the way through and I get into Office 365. So that's just one example of setting up an Active Directory uh, service in Azure. And uh, that's pretty much the uh, demonstration I think we have time for right now. I think we're going to be wrapping up. Uh, but hopefully this has given a fairly good deep dive overview. Uh, I know there's a lot that goes into it. Um, there's a lot of things to learn. But the good news is that there are a ton of resources. If you ever get stuck, if you're in any of these windows in Azure, you can hit the help button and go to help and support and you'll be able to find your way to you know whatever support issues you're looking for if you need to go back to getting started again it's so it's right here and it brings you to the uh, tutorials so uh, i hope you've enjoyed this demonstration uh, i know that there will be some questions uh, and i believe that um, danielle will handle some of the questions uh, after the webinar and Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks for diving in and showing us how to get started on Microsoft Azure and speak on some of the fundamentals. To follow up after this webinar, we're going to be sending everyone an example of the different cost breakdowns. So if you are interested in setting up an Azure bot or Azure Active Directory or site recovery. We'll just show you some examples how Jeff touched on um, the estimates. So we'll send that over as well as follow up to see if you want to schedule another meeting where we can go into a cost comparison on how much the cost would difference of cost um, compared to on-premise versus the cloud and Microsoft currently has some funding available through the end of the year for setting up a proof of concept so certain customers that qualify if you're interested in setting up a new workload on Azure um, to reach a thousand dollars of mon monthly spend you may qualify for some of that funding we also work with customers to show differences between opex and capex monthly consumption estimates so we'll be covering all that in our follow-up thanks again everybody